So you want to be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up, guys? And welcome to another episode of the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Catani. Today, I'm joined by the great Brian Burke. Brian is president and CEO of Praxis Capital Inc., a ver vertically integrated real estate private equity investment firm. Brian has acquired over $800 million worth of real estate over a 30-year career, including over 4,000 multifamily units and more than 700 single-family homes with the assistance of proprietary software that he wrote himself. Brian has subdivided land, built homes, and constructed self-storage, but really prefers to reposition existing multifamily properties. Brian is the author of The Hands-Off Investor, an investor's guide to investing in passive real estate syndications is a frequent public speaker at, a, at real estate conferences and events nationwide. Brian, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me today, Jonathan. Only took three tries for the intro, but... I knew you'd nail that. it. I had faith in you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, awesome. You've obviously had a very uh, great career in the few days that you've been in the industry. Um, Just a few. Hopefully it keeps going for a little while. I'm not ready to give it up yet. I love that. I definitely want to get into that and kind of what keeps you motivated. But let's start at the very beginning. How did you discover, you know, real estate investing to start? Oh, wow. You want to bring back those painful days, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. I think it was just a crazy idea I had. You know, I was uh, always trying to figure out how I was going to be able to, you know, be an entrepreneur or make money when I was young. So right after I got out of high school, started up this little thing where I was selling books. Like uh, it was, a you'd mail out a bunch of things it was back when you actually mailed stuff to people. Remember those days? You saw, I, I'd mail out like uh, things about these different books that we had for sale. And if somebody would order a book, then I would send the order form into the publisher and they would drop ship the books. So I thought, well, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to sell these books, I need to know, I need to read them all. Right. So one of the books is a book on real estate investing and I read it and something with me just clicked. It was probably the worst real estate book ever written. I mean, it wasn't like one that somebody actually sold because people wanted it. It was just like this stupid mail order thing, but I was, I was just intrigued by this whole concept of, of buying real estate, especially when it got to the part where it said that you could buy real estate with no money down. Cause I thought this is perfect for me because I don't have any money. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, you know, I don't know anything. I don't know anyone and I don't have any money. So I guess I'm going to get in the real estate business and then the rest is history. Okay. So did you start with single family, like the tried and true method, fix and flips, or what, what was kind of your first intro? Yeah, my first one was actually a rental and, uh, I didn't even own my own house yet. Uh, but I decided I, I would, uh, it would be smart to buy a rental. So, uh, I found, uh, this really cheap house. And uh, I, I went back to this book, you know, it said you could do it with no money down. So I asked the seller, I said, you know, hey, if I got a loan from a lender, uh, you know, would you carry back the down payment for me? And they're like, oh, yeah, we would do that. And I thought, oh, wow, all this stuff in this book does work. I mean, that was easy. All you had to do is ask. And so I managed to find a lender to give me a loan on the like 80% of the purchase price. And then the seller carried back the other 20%. And now I was a landlord. Wow, that's awesome. And so obviously did it, you know, kind of lead to you realizing you needed to scale and you jumped into commercial real estate or how did that uh, intro happen? Oh, I'd love to say I was smart enough to do all of that. No. And it, in fact, uh, it was like a couple of years of hell of, you know, dealing with this rental and then, you know, and then having to evict a person. And then, um, and then it was like, it was left as a mess. So then I had to fix it up with money I didn't have. And, uh, and finally sold it and lost money. And it was like, okay, this is a horrible experience. I think I'm going to do it again. So, <laughs> so, then, so then I decided, well, instead of, uh, you know, all this tenant stuff, I'll just get into flipping business where I don't have to deal with tenants. So I started flipping houses and, you know, I was buying them, fixing up and reselling them. And uh, then I, I did that about probably 500 times before I, I really got into, um, you know, commercial investing. Wow. So you got like really into the fix and flip game, actually scaled a fix, fix and flip business before you got into commercial real estate. That's awesome. 
Yeah, you don't I hear guess, that too often. Yeah, I know. And I guess you could say like maybe 500 is an exaggeration. I probably did about maybe 200 by the time I had gotten my first commercial real estate investment. But okay. then I did about 300 more before I really got into, you know, commercial multifamily and, and actually scaling and growing, you know, a syndication business. By that time, I did have about 500, you know, single family houses under my belt. And is this about the time that Praxis Capital came to be? Yeah, well, pretty much. I mean, really, Praxis Capital was just me incorporating this little, you know, kind of one person business idea that I started with. And uh, it was about 10 years after I got started when I incorporated. And during that 10 year period, you know, I was doing a couple of houses a year. There were some years I did no houses. Uh, you know, I went to the police academy and, you know, so I didn't, I, I just didn't have time to do any real estate then. But so, you know, I took a couple of years away from real estate and then finally later uh, started getting into it a little bit more heavy, uh, especially after the market collapse in uh, 05, 06, 07. That's when I really got heavy into doing like a massive quantity of, of flips. You know, I was doing maybe a dozen houses a year tops. Um, you know, before 2009, but after 2009, you know, instantly I was doing 100 to 120 a year. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, houses were pennies on the dollar after that crash, especially in the residential world. So now let's kind of flip. Obviously, at this point, Praxis is now a thing. It's kind of predicated on this proprietary software that you wrote yourself. So did you go to school for that or where, where did this kind of come about the software and, and what does it do? Well, kind of like, um, you know, I did when I learned how to invest in real estate, I learned how to program reading books. And so I, uh, I, I just read a bunch of books and started creating my own software. This happened probably about uh, 25 years ago is when I really got started on it. And it took me about five years to perfect it and really about 10 years to like get it to the level where it is now. Uh, but I just recognized a need that I had that nobody had a solution for. And I decided, you know, hey, I know what I need better than anybody else knows. So I'm going to create it myself. Uh, and I did. And it gave us an incredible competitive advantage. And that it, this was a software I, I developed for our house flipping business. And uh, that's I could not have scaled to buying over 100 houses a year without it. It, it absolutely was the key to our success. Uh, you know, then when I got into multifamily, I realized that, you know, I had a certain way of thinking about multifamily financial analysis and nobody had anything commercially available for me that would uh, analyze a deal the way I wanted to analyze it. So once again, I'm like, well, then I will create it myself. Uh, so I did. And, you know, now we have our own proprietary underwriting platform and, and we use that to this day to analyze uh, multifamily acquisitions. So do you just it's kind of just a plug and play doesn't require someone to in, like punch in the numbers separately or kind of how does that work? Yeah, it's basically, uh, you know, our on the multifamily one is it's an Excel based system that's designed to uh, kind of take all the different things that we need to look at as a multifamily investor, uh, all the way from, you know, the unit mix to, you know, current rents to future rents to factoring in rent growth, expenses, debt service, capital improvements, uh, investor waterfalls, you know, how the capital will be distributed. I mean, the whole thing from A to Z, you know, basically when we set up a, a deal, we can plug in everything we need up front and we have everything we need to take us through the life cycle, the entire investment. It'll forecast our sale price every year for the next 10 years. I mean, it kind of basically does everything that we need to think about uh, when analyzing a deal. It, it handles all that for us. Wow, that's awesome. So it obviously makes it far more efficient to analyze deals, especially in today's marketplace. Any competitive advantage you can have is, is huge and you know, obviously I can imagine you guys are still underwriting, you know, hundreds of deals before you're even making an offer, much like everyone else. So obviously, you know, we kind of alluded to it in the intro. The biggest thing that you love is repositioning already existing multifamily properties. So, you know, kind of talk about your thesis on that and what you look for in a deal and, and uh, you know, kind of go from there. Yeah, you know, really the first thing I look at is market. You know, where is the where is the property located? You know, and, and I don't mean like 
Maine and Maine, I mean, like, you know, what city, what state, where is it is. So the first criteria for us is I want to see that the property is located in a place that people are moving to and that it's not in a place where people are moving from. You know, that's my number one criteria. The next thing we're looking at is we're looking at historical and future forecasted rent growth uh, in the market and in the sub market where the property is located. We're looking at the vintage of the property. You know, I won't buy nowadays. I won't buy anything built before 1980. Uh, I really prefer to uh, buy stuff that's built after 2000. We're just kind of doing more of a flight to quality here lately. Uh, you know, we'll look at uh, crime statistics in the area. We'll look at uh, school uh, ratings. We'll look at median household incomes. And kind of those are the first tests that we look at on any property. And assuming that it matches all of our criteria, uh, you know, then the next thing that we're looking at is, you know, is the real estate. You know, we, we want more than 100 units. We want built after 1980. We want, you know, prefer pitched composition shingle roofs. You know, we prefer um, anything but wood siding, you know, there's just a, a lot of things like physical attributes of the, of the property that we look for. Um, and then, you know, if it checks all the boxes, then we throw it into our underwriting queue. And then it's just a matter of numbers, right? It's like the numbers pencil out, um, you know, at the price that we would have to pay to get this or not. And if it's not, then we chuck it. If it is, then we put in an offer. Okay. Makes perfect sense. And <clears throat> those are pretty solid criteria. It sounds like so does this allow you, it obviously allows you to be nimble. So are you open to, like a lot of people are like, no, we only are in these markets. Does this make it so you're open to almost any market as long as it fits those parameters? Well, we certainly, uh, we're open to any market that fits the parameters, but you know, the number of markets that fit those parameters is a pretty limited uh, set. So that means that we find ourselves saying, no, these are our markets, right? And so uh, that doesn't change much. You know, we're always looking like every quarter we're looking at data uh, to see what markets are emerging, uh, what ones are starting to turn a corner, what ones are, you know, fading off the list. Funny thing about it is, is that almost every quarter it's the usual suspects. You know, it's Phoenix, Vegas, anywhere in Texas, Atlanta, anywhere in Florida, uh, Carolinas. I mean, those are pretty much where we're seeing um, really good strength. So those are pretty much almost always on our list. Uh, but, you know, there might be other smaller markets that that might come and go here and there. Makes perfect sense. Obviously, sometimes those tertiary and secondary markets pop up and, you know, you're starting to I'm obviously, like you said, anywhere in Texas, that's obviously including those secondary and tertiary markets and places that people haven't even heard of, you know, are starting to pop up on the radar and, and investors are moving in there. So. Awesome. So I guess, obviously, you guys are fully, uh, you know, vertically integrated. Kind of talk about that progression. You know, was that kind of your plan from the start or did that just kind of happen organically? Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't planned from the start. I'll tell you that I never wanted to be in the property management business. Uh, I think there's no uh, more difficult business to be in than property management. So when I started in multifamily, you know, we were, uh, I had a third party manager on my very first one. I had a third party manager. Then I thought I can do a better job than these guys. I'm going to hire my own on-site manager and deal with this myself and get rid of this management company. And I did that and it was not a good experience. So finally I brought a third party manager back on. This is my very first deal like 20 years ago and kind of learned my lesson that I'm not a good property manager. So <laughs> always had a management company. And when I scaled up into larger multifamily, we we're just hiring the best third party managers we could find in the local areas where each of the properties were located. Uh, but, you know, kind of as I progressed up the ladder here and started acquiring a larger portfolio and started having conversations with institutional investors and other, you know, larger, uh, larger sources of capital, it became clear to me that there's a strong preference on behalf of investors for groups that manage their own assets. And, and it's obviously for a reason. I mean, they've come to learn that, uh, that vertically integrated companies have full control of their portfolio and overall can do a better job managing you know, a widespread portfolio than a hodgepodge mix of a variety of third-party management companies, especially even from the standpoint of just like financial reporting and that sort of stuff. So 
about uh, several years ago, uh, just through stroke of luck, uh, managed to meet um, you know three guys that ultimately ended up joining our company. And one of them was a career property manager. And he had start, he was the president of uh, Grubb and Ellis's multifamily management company, he actually started it for them and had started uh, multifamily management platforms on a national scale six times in his you know, 35 year career. Wow. And that was an incredible opportunity for me to say, okay, now I get to have vertical integration. Now I get to have uh, property management you know, right here, but I don't have to be the property manager. I don't have to do it. I don't have to deal with, you know, uh, trying to find and select and manage site staff and, you know, and all those complexities that I knew I wasn't good at. Uh, and that allowed us to bring that vertical integration. So it was an interesting growth process, but you have to have enough scale to have it make sense. You know, we thought if we got to 1500 units, it'd be a great time. And, uh, and that's how we, that's kind of how we did it. Awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's honestly what I've heard is once you get up into that sort of upper echelon of assets under management, and like you said, sort of that upper echelon of investor, that's really where it makes sense. Because from what I understand, the margins aren't really there if you're kind of a smaller smaller portfolio. Is that is that true? Yeah. And, and I don't even know if it's really about margins. I mean, for us, the the management company isn't really designed as a profit center. It's really more of a control issue. Okay. And so what, what, what happens is if you're, if you're too small, your, your uh, internal property management company is going to charge a management fee just like anybody else. So if, if you're too small and you only have 100 units, the management fees on 100 units that you're going to be able to collect aren't going to be enough to support a staff uh, to make that management company a management company. Uh, you have to have at least enough assets to bring in enough fee to support some salaries. And so, for example, uh, you're going to need a corporate controller. Somebody's going to have to count the money. And, you know, that's going to cost you, call it 100 grand a year with benefits, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, uh, depending on where you're at. But that's, you know, you have to have enough management fee to be able to cover that. Uh, if you've got to have an office space, you're going to need money to cover that. If you're going to have, uh, you know, a, a regional manager or, you know, a, a CEO in charge of whatever it is, uh, you know, that you got to have revenue coming from somewhere in order to make it feasible. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So it's really just a, a scalability thing. Okay. So at, at, obviously, you know, you're at that point. So what are some of the challenges now that you face, you know, with growing the company and kind of the future, as opposed to, you know, maybe some of these smaller, uh, smaller portfolios? Well, I mean, I, I probably don't face any unique challenge. I think the challenge that we have now is the same one everybody's having is it's, uh, it's price discovery and, uh, and, and acquisition. You know, that's, that's really been our biggest challenge. And by price discovery, what I mean is, you know, for 20 years, you know, you're, you're buying real estate at X and now all of a sudden you have to buy it at Y and you have to get yourself comfortable with that. Uh, it wasn't that long ago I was buying multifamily units for $45,000 a door, and they were decent units, uh, you know, not like burned down. <laughs> I mean, they were like decent units. And, uh, you know, and now those same units are $150,000 a door, if you're lucky. And, you know, with the, uh, you know, we have a little bit, like I said earlier, we have a flight to quality, we're buying higher quality assets. So now we're getting into stuff that's between $200,000 and $300,000 a door that you know, a couple of years ago, I could have bought for $100,000 to $150,000 a door. So my biggest challenge right now is getting comfortable with that price point, uh, comfortable enough to actually add to our portfolio. And what I found is that we've been shrinking for the last two years. We sold almost 2,000 units last year in 2021, and we're going to be selling about 450 units this year in 2022. Uh, so, uh, you know, we keep selling and it's difficult to buy. And so we're shrinking ourselves into, uh, into oblivion. So we've got to figure out how to kind of get past some of those psychological barriers. Absolutely. And kind of picking backing off of that, what, what do you see kind of as the future, obviously prices have increased at what they're increasing at. You mentioned, you know, obviously you're in some of the big markets, which is obviously where those price increases are, are happening. Are you 
sensing a bit of an asset price bubble in some of these markets. Some of these these sale prices are starting to get a little scary when you're two and a half Xing 18 months after acquisition and things like that. So kind of talk about, you know, where you kind of see the, the market headed. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, we have a property or two properties right now we're selling that we bought less than 18 months ago that are worth almost double what we paid for them. So, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely seen a dramatic uh, increase just in the recent past within the last you know, 12 to uh, 18 months. And within the last 12 months, it's been an incredible increase. So there's certainly no doubt about that. But, you know, our focus is kind of twofold. One is to produce the greatest result we can for our investors. And the, and the second, which is actually the real main priority, is uh, not to lose people's money. Uh, you know, we're, our, our entire business is, is, is fed by passive investors who invest in real estate syndications and funds uh, that uh, we use to go and acquire this real estate. And, you know, our, our primary objective is to not lose that money. And, you know, uh, we, um, we can't make money by, uh, by, by losing people's money, right? So uh, I don't think that we're in you know, a so-called bubble where, uh, where an immediate loss is imminent. I mean, I'm not thinking like, okay, prices ran up. So if we buy today, they're going to run back down and we're going to lose all this money. I don't think that's really where we are. Instead, uh, where we are is that rents have doubled. And when rents, you know, nearly double, then prices go up substantially. Those prices aren't going to tumble back to where they were unless rents tumble back to where they were. And that's highly unlikely to happen at this point. So, so really people wanna focus so much on the stability of the valuation based upon you know, resale value. But what they really gotta focus on is you gotta focus on the rental rate because that's what's driving the real estate value. And if you believe rents are about to tumble, then you better sell your real estate now. Uh, if you think rents are stable or rents are increasing, then you're going to be fine. And, and I, that's where I think we are. There's a lot of demand out there for uh, rentals. There's not a lot of real estate being constructed and the cost to do so is rising by the day. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think these valuations are going to hold up. It's just, um, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see some flattening and a little bit of pain due to increased interest rates. Um, but uh, I think that's probably the, the major threat uh, or the main threat that we're facing right now. Okay, that makes perfect sense. And I was listening to another podcast and they had an economist on and and he talked about how 2021 is really that, like what we saw, you know, I think what Austin went up like 23% over the year in, in rental increase. And so he talked about how 2021 is really was that, that that's like what was supposed to happen now it should start getting back to you know gradual increases is that kind of what you're seeing as well and and how you kind of predict things to go yeah i think so you know you're hitting an affordability ceiling right so you know we had this this weird thing where you know in 2021 in part because people were given a lot of money uh, whether it was through just checks mailed by the government or um, you know, there was a lot of um, bonus uh, unemployment cash floating around, and there was just a lot of money circulating in the system. And, you know, the, and then that led to people not going to work and people not going to work led to employers raising wages in order to get people to come to work. And, you know, now you've got, you've had this kind of like massive repricing of labor that happened, especially on the lower end of the wage tier. So, you know, like ten dollar an hour employees are almost a thing of the past. It's like now I think wages are starting at fifteen. That's a fifty percent increase in a year. So you know that means that you know on a three to one ratio of rent to income, which is usually the qualification guidelines for most tenants, uh, if if a, if a person has a fifty percent increase in pay, uh, you know they can afford almost twice as much rent or more than twice as much rent. So that started happening, and people were frantically bidding on apartments and and you know that's what caused a lot of the rent growth that we're seeing you know and we've seen eight hundred dollar rents go to sixteen hundred inside of one year in some markets that we're in so 
uh, you know, that's contributing to uh, an increase in, in real estate value. So, I mean, you got to trace it all the way back to the source. That $15 an hour employee isn't going back to 10 bucks. So, so that means that the $1,600 rent isn't going back to 800 and therefore the value isn't going back to what it was two years ago. Now, what is going to happen, and we're seeing this already, I mean, it's pretty obvious in most people's daily lives, is that that $15 an hour employees, other expenses are going up. Now gas is going up, food is going up, you know, it basically all consumer goods are seeing increases in pricing. Now that's putting pressure on that income. And that's going to be a barrier to seeing further rent increases unless we see, uh, you know, the kind of wage growth that we saw over the last, you know, one to two years, which I doubt that we're going to see. Okay, that's a really, really good point. And <clears throat> That's like you said, that consumer spending increasing. Hopefully, as things start to cool down, obviously a lot happening overseas and, and internationally. But, you know, a lot of people are saying that that should also start to ease as well. And hopefully that will kind of start to balance out. It's hard to predict if anything's going to crash or anything like that. Do you foresee any, I mean, obviously we can't predict something like COVID, but, you know, give your best prediction. Do you think, you know, a crash, so to speak, is coming? I put that in quotation marks. Well, you know, it's funny, every crash looks a little bit different, you know, know. so it's, it, you know, we, it, you'd have to almost get down to, you know, minute definitions of various crash scenarios. Uh, but no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you know, we're, we're selling these two assets that we just bought like a year and a half ago, not because I don't believe in the market anymore. We're selling because we got this tremendous increase in value over a very short period of time. So when that happens, it causes your return on equity to diminish greatly because let's say, let's say you have a you know, $30 million apartment complex, uh, then you had 10 million of equity because you put 10 million down, right? So now the $30 million apartment complex goes to 60 million. Now you have $40 million of equity. So if, you're, if your return on 10 million was okay, your return when that 10 is now 40 is crap. So you need to sell, harvest the capital, then reinvest that capital into other assets to put that money really to work. That's why we're selling, not because I think there's a crash right around the corner, but the hard part is then turning the capital around and investing in other assets at a higher basis. And that's where we are now. And I feel comfortable doing that in a lot of circumstances, but not every circumstance. I mean, number one, it's got to be in a market that has a lot of strength and one that has future rent growth, a market where people are moving to uh, markets where people are moving from might see a crash. Uh, you know, there, there's vacancies are stacking up and, you know, rents are declining and then that sort of thing. And when rents decline, values decline. So I think there's some risk there. I think there's some risk in cap rate decompression, and that's going to happen mostly because of reduction in rent growth. People think that cap rates are tied directly to interest rates and like, well, if interest rates go up, cap rates will go up. Well, not necessarily. If rent growth is tremendously strong, rent growth can overpower the headwind of higher interest rates and cap rates can remain low. Uh, but if the rent growth starts to taper and interest rates start to climb, we're going to see some decompression of cap rates. And that's going to cause some lower valuations relative to income. But if the income is still increased, you really haven't lost any true value. So I, I, don't, I don't see a big crash. If somebody's saying like, well, I'm just going to wait around and then I'm going to scoop everything up for 50 cents on the dollar, uh, you're probably going to be pretty disappointed. Now, where I do see some potential for opportunity is looking out on the horizon, maybe two or three years. And my, my view is that far out because uh, of what's happening today. Right now, we're seeing a lot of buyers acquiring large multifamily assets using high leverage bridge debt, which means high loan to value, low down payments, lots of debt uh, against that real estate. And they typically have a three-year maturity. So when those uh, notes start to come due, if valuations haven't climbed the way the uh, owner expected, or if cash flow never materialized and they can't service the debt, some of those loans are going to find themselves in a position where they have no exit. They can't sell because they owe more than the property's worth now because you know maybe the income's declined a little bit or whatever, or they leverage so much. Uh, or they can't refinance because their loan to value ratio is too high. 
uh, and they can't get an extension on their three-year uh, bridge debt because they don't meet the debt yield requirements because there's always tests. You, you don't just get an extension. You have to qualify for one. If they don't qualify, you don't get it. And that means there could be uh, some properties finding themselves in foreclosure or receivership uh, when those maturities come due. So, so at that point in time, we might see some opportunity out in the marketplace to get some uh, properties at a little bit of a discount. But uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of a uh, lot of money chasing after those assets. Absolutely, and you and you really nailed it on the head. The over leverage, I think, is what is the biggest factor. You know, so many people just want to get the deal done. And in, you know, over the last 18 months, that works, but over the long term, that just it can't be viable. And like you said, that's gonna that's gonna come to a head. And you know, hopefully it's not too extreme, but um, you know, some of these deals I'm seeing are uh, the debt stacks are a little bit a uh, little scary for sure. Well, after the collapse of the real estate market in 05, 06, 07. Uh, you know, I was buying foreclosures all over the place, even uh, apartment complexes in foreclosure. And in almost every case, uh, out of probably five or 600 properties we bought during that uh, period of time, almost every one of them had more debt on it than the property was worth at the time it was foreclosed. And so, you know, the people that get in the most trouble are the ones that have the most leverage. So, you know, when we're buying, we're buying at extraordinarily low leverage. Uh, you know, of course, that caused our returns to suffer. But again, I can only make our investors money if we don't lose their money. So it's really important for us to preserve that capital. I'm, I'm more concerned about that than I am about the return. And so, you know, investors that are seeking kind of a safe risk adjusted return will come to us. Investors that are just looking for the highest return out there, you know, risk be damned. Uh, they're not going to they're not going to invest with us. You know, they'll find somebody else that's taking on more risk, which I'm totally fine with. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's the debt is kind of the big issue. And, and it's something that people need to really be thinking about right now, um, especially in the face of all this uncertainty of taking on too much debt. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's a really great point. Well, listen, I've appreciated it. We're now uh, getting to the end. I have, obviously you could probably talk for hours and hours about this. So I really appreciate it, but I do have five questions that I ask all of my guests. It's the final five questions. The first one is, what is the best advice that you've gotten from a mentor? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, I've never had one. Oh, wow. So, so that means that uh, the best advice that I ever got was uh, uh, get a mentor, because <laughs> I probably could have figured this out a lot faster and been successful sooner if I had somebody to kind of lead me down the path instead of having to figure it all out for myself. Do you mentor now? Or like, are you a mentor? No, uh, no, my, my focus is 100% dedicated to performing for my investors. And I, I just don't have any uh, empty space left on my plate uh, for uh, out extracurricular activities. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. What is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Uh, I get to decide my own fate in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I, I'm in control of my schedule. I'm in control of my life. And, and to me, I'm not cut from the corporate cloth. Uh, so my why is independence. And, um, and this allows me to satisfy that 100%. I love that. And so you mentioned that you have read a lot of books, maybe still do. So what's your favorite non-real estate or investment related book? Uh, you know, funny that you say that I haven't, I hardly ever read books because I don't have time anymore, but uh, every once in a while, I'll get a chance to read one. Uh, so one of the ones I have, it's probably one of the most recent books I read, which was like four years ago, it's called Real Leaders Don't Do PowerPoint. I love that book because it's a book on how to give presentations without boring people to death. And, and uh, you yeah, this business is all about communication. And people think it's all about the real estate, right? It's like, oh, you got to read all these real estate books and know everything you need to know about real estate. Well, I kind of already know pretty much everything I need to know about real estate. I've been doing this long enough. Uh, but delivering your message and sharing with other people your ideas and, and getting those people to understand your ideas and your concept and uh, want to be a part of it is an interesting skill. And, uh, and so that book and another book called TED Talks, which is written by the head of the TED Talk organization, uh, are two books that I think are great books on um, kind of delivering your message and certainly has helped me out a lot. Love that. That's awesome. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? 
Uh, oh man, I don't even know what a superpower is. Uh, <laughs> I would say, uh, if I, if I could do absolutely anything, it probably would be to be able to reach out to people and kind of share what we're doing better. Uh, you know, there's a, the, some of the most successful people that I've seen in this business have been ones that were like expert marketers. And I am not that I'm horrible at marketing. And so therefore, um, I consider marketing is probably a, a superpower because it's so foreign to me. <laughs> if I could figure that out and deliver a message more effectively and efficiently, I'd probably be doing a lot better right now. I love that. Yeah. I mean, subjective, right? Other people look at your portfolio and are like, oh, wow, I want to do exactly what he's doing. So yeah. Awesome. And it, it's funny you say that. And I've also, it's funny, funny story, just look really quick. I had, I've actually had investors invest with me and said, I'm only investing with you because you're not out there marketing. It's like, <laughs> it's like you know, I've just, I'm leery of these people that are out there marketing and are all over social media and everything, but you don't do any of that. And I love that. And I thought, well, that's an interesting reason, but I'll take it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. And what's the best way for people to uh, get a hold of you and if they want to learn more? Uh, probably through either through our website, which is praxcap.com. It's P R A X C A P.com. You can also find me on biggerpockets.com in the forums, answering questions in the uh, Q and A forums or on their blog, uh, or uh, check me out on Instagram at investor Brian Burke. Awesome. Love it. We will link all of that in the show notes. Brian, thank you so much. This has been incredible. It's been good. Thanks for having me on, Jonathan. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.